Research and Health Nexus in Africa. We do have members um, from across the African region and we'd like to welcome you. If you are joining us for the first time, we'd, welcome, well, we'd like to welcome you to our webinar. And today we are pleased um, to have um, Gigma, who is a renowned um, scientist with expertise in climate risk and anticipatory action. Um, focused on climate and conflict, in addition to his research and interest in heat waves. Um, Gigma is currently working with the Red Cross and is based in the Sahel region. He also has extensive experience working with the National Meteorological and Hydrological Services. In addition to that, we also have a commentary that will be done by Dr. Mayamela, who has vast experience um, and is a public health special specialist with a focus on health system strengthening and HIV and recently in climate change and health. Um, Dr. Mayamela leads the Vatsarachai Climate Change and Health Research Studies that focus on extreme heat on vulnerable populations. She's also a steering committee member and has recently taken up a deputy CEO position at the Foundation for Professional Development, which their primary focus is on capacity building, um, both in um, the private and public sector um, in strengthening health systems. Um, so without um, further ado, I'm going to allow Gigma to please take us through the first presentation. We'd also encourage um, people to please introduce yourself on the chat and you can um, submit any questions that we will take uh, later on during the session. Um, Gigma, over to you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. And yes, we can. can see my we can see your screen. Please put it on presentation mode. Okay, let's move to that quickly. Is it working now? That's perfect. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everyone, for taking time to join this discussion. It is um, an emerging topic in the West Africa region. This year, we have been plagued uh, by uh, extreme heat. And uh, as you will see later in, in the presentation, it has been quite uh, disastrous. But uh, uh, the most painful thing about it is that we don't even know to what extent it has been uh, a disaster. So uh, uh, let's uh, quickly go through the slides I have prepared. So um, first of all, what's the context? You know that West Africa is this uh, region which is located in the northern part of Africa, just below uh, uh, the Sahara Desert. It is uh, a region which has two main subregions. We have the Sahel region, which is located in the northern part at the border with the Sahara Desert. It is a semi-arid region. And we have uh, the Gulf of Guinea countries, the, 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 city, the coastal part of West Africa, which has a more humid climate and which also witnessed uh, uh, quite, quite severe heat waves uh, this year, specific, specifically at the beginning of the year in February. But this presentation, is going to uh, focus mostly on the Sahel region, which is uh, the semi-arid region. What's the, the, the context of that region? First of all, uh, in terms of the setup, we know that temperatures have increased there quite uh, significantly in the recent decades over this side. There has been a quite uh, some, um, some extensive studies on the characteristics of uh, interannual and even intra-annual temperature variation in the region, and it is clear that there is an increase, a steady increase of temperatures. And this is an illustration that I am showing uh, uh, in terms of uh, the heat index, which is uh, a mix of temperature and humidity. And you can see the evolution of that heat index from 1979 through to 2014. And it is clear that there is a, 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 a sharp trend, you can see that when you use the observational based uh, data, which is the GSOT, global summary of the D data, we have a trend which is about 0 0.36 degrees per decade. In other, in other terms, uh, 
uh, uh, every hundred years, we are going, we are increasing the temperature by eight degrees in the region using that index, just to say how severe the warming is in the region. This is what was observed in the past. And when we look at what will happen in the future, the different climate scenario, it is unfortunately expected that actually this is going to, to become worse in the next couple of years. So we we'll see an increase in uh, 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 the duration, in the, let's say all the characteristics of heat waves, duration, frequency, intensity, and even the spatial extent, that is uh, uh, the areas that are covered by the extreme heat. Now in terms of how, how, how much do we know in terms of the variability of the heat season, the, re the region has uh, two main heat wave uh, uh, seasons. The first one happens during uh, 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 the March to June period. It is the longer and more severe one. And there is another one happening between October and November. So it lasts only a couple of weeks, six, eight weeks, something like that. And um, uh, it is less severe in terms of the magnitude. But for the, for the spring one, for the March to June one, there has been some studies that have shown that there is a quite strong correlation with El Nino. After the peak of El Nino in the Pacific Ocean, the following March to June season in the Sahel is always hotter than usual. This has been observed several times in the, in the, in the record and uh, uh, cases of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, significantly hotter than usual conditions were observed in 1998, 2005, 2010, 2016, 19, and 20. And actually, I'm highlighting 2010 because this one had a similar setup as what we saw this year in terms of the configuration, in addition to the impact as well. 2010 was uh, one of the hottest years in the region that also led to several impacts. And there is also some documentation about that. And so still, in terms of the context, what did we know? We knew that uh, heat waves are becoming more frequent in the region. We know that under climate change, this is becoming worse. But at the beginning of the season, what were the climate, uh, uh, the numerical models telling us? And this is a map of the top 20% temperature, seasonal temperature forecast issued by uh, several meteorological centers. This is a multimodal average for the Africa region. As we can see, all the map look quite uh, red, but the difference, of course, is that in these different regions, although it is red, it is not the hottest season of the year. Whereas in the Sahel region, which is located somewhere here, it is exactly at this time of the year that the season is, uh, the temperature is at its peak. So we are expecting this kind of, more, uh, let's say, a bad coincidence in terms of uh, uh, temperature peak this year, there was some strong confidence that the season was going to be particularly hot this year. And unfortunately, it turned to be true. This forecast I was showing was what we, we had as early as January. And then this is, the season is still ongoing. I said that it starts in March and will end uh, 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 in June. So we are still in the season. But I'm just taking an illustration. This is the average temperature for uh, uh, the period from the 1st to the 24th of April this year. That is just uh, uh, last month. I may need to actually update this figure. But what we see is that this clearly gives you an indication of how hot the Sahel region was during that month. You can see from Senegal through to Chad and even parts of Sudan, we have temperatures that are in the range of 40 to 44 degrees, to 45 degrees. It was extremely severe indeed. Of course, the region is relatively hot, but this is for, uh, at the scale of a map, having an average which is between 40 and 45 is really, really extreme, even for this region. And I want to give you an illustration of how severe it was by just picking a couple of days in the temperature pattern of your region. I'm going to show the case 
for two countries, Senegal and Burkina Faso. So uh, what you have on the left is the observed temperatures in uh, Senegal on, I think it was on the 2nd of April. And what you have on the right is something similar, but for Burkina Faso, and this one was on the 4th of April. So when you look at what you have on the, on the right in Burkina Faso, you will see that, for example, the capital city observed a record temperature of 45 degrees Celsius. And of course, there are many other places that have seen these temperatures when you take uh, the city of where we are in the northwest of the country, Bugande in the east, these have observed a staggering temperature of 45 degrees. And actually, when you take another station like Dori, we didn't uh, get the report for that day, but it is a city which is typically, the, it is typically the hottest city in the country. So we could have seen even higher uh, temperatures there. And when you get to uh, uh, to Senegal, you will see that the situation is even worse. In the easternmost part of the country, in the regions, uh, let's say neighboring Mauritania and Mali, you will see some cities record recording a temperature of up to 47 degrees Celsius. You will see this is very, very dramatic, even for the Sahel region. And here I'm showing the kind of temperature evolution for two countries again, on the right we have Mali, and on the uh, uh, on the left we have Mali, and on the right we have Burkina Faso for different weather stations. And as you can see, when we take the case of Mali, for example, and I think that many people have heard of this situation, there is this city Kai that observed at the beginning of April a temperature of forty eight point four degrees Celsius. This is the highest ever value uh, observed for the month of April for the entire African region, just to say how hot this situation is. And when you go, and yeah, in Mali, we see that many stations have exceeded the 45 degree threshold, most of them actually. And in Burkina Faso, you'll also see that many have exceeded the 44 degree Celsius, and many have even uh, reached the 45 degrees Celsius thresholds. Just to say how silly uh, the situation really was in the Sahel. What has been the impact? So what has this situation uh, 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 made in terms of impact? There is a bit of context that we need to know, first of all. It is that this peak of temperature actually coincided with the Ramadan, and the region is largely Muslim, meaning that Many people were fasting, including some of the most vulnerable people. And then I, say, I, I, I showed at the beginning the temperature forecast from the global models. This has actually not been disseminated by the National Meteorological Services in the region. So there was no seasonal forecast warning to prepare people to face that specific heat. Of course, close to some major events the, the, the National Med Services will issue some warnings ex, uh, going out to um, a couple of days, uh, uh, at most one week, but nothing more than that. So people were, didn't receive the seasonal or even the sub-seasonal information they needed to take action. And as I was also saying at the beginning, in terms of the impact, the worst thing about it is that we cannot actually measure the full extent of the impact. We are not certain actually what really happened. We could actually guess what happened just from the media reporting that was uh, 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 that was done in the region. Actually, there have been several major reports and it is, uh, let's say the major basis that we are using to actually assess how severe the situation has been in terms of the impact. There has been no quantitative assessment made by governments, made by public uh, public health officials or something like that. We do not have the figures, we do not have the numbers. It's just based on, uh, let's say, the interviews that uh, 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 the medias have given to a couple of specialists across the region that we could grab some of the impacts. 
Many sectors have been impacted, and um, uh, here I'm just uh, I've made a selection of let's say uh, the more severe cases from the media. Of course, as I said, there has been many many major outings, so we have uh, many reports. But I've just summarized here what have been the most important. When we take the energy sector, and I'm starting with this, I will explain why later. We have seen like uh, in many countries, especially in Burkina Faso and Mali, lots and lots of power cuts. The power cuts, of course, could be related to the fact that uh, uh, the infrastructure uh, wasn't good enough. But of course, the heat has also increased the demand and these national power energy uh, power companies were no longer able to actually meet that demand, leading to a lot of power cuts. And in these countries, we have power cuts that lasted at least 12 hours. And in some extreme cases, we have seen places where power went off for more than two days, up to three days in some cases in Mali. We will see that in the link that I've provided. Why I've started with the, with the energy sector? It is actually because this lack of energy also deprived people from some of the cooling options. We can no longer turn a fan, we can no longer turn an AC, and therefore you become more vulnerable. And that is why we we'll see a lot of impacts on the health sector. And there we have lots and lots of, 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 of reports. I can list but a few. We have, for example, in Mali on uh, Friday, the 5th of April alone, 44 bodies being buried in one cemetery in, uh, in Bamako. In the same city of Bamako, one hospital recorded uh, a, a total of 102 deaths in just the first four days of April. And this is to be compared with the 130 deaths in total they recorded for the entire April of last year. So in four days, you just get 102 days for this year, whereas last year at the same time, but for the whole month, we have up to 130 deaths. In Ouagadougou, uh, uh, the capital city of Burkina Faso, uh, um, there were reports that all mortuaries were actually full. There was no longer place to admit new bodies. Uh, in uh, uh, the second city of Burkina Faso, one hospital recorded 50 deaths just in, uh, uh, in April. And this is the internal deaths, deaths of people, patients that were interned at the hospital. We had, they, they said they received up to 55 people uh, from, uh, let's say, the, the, the different districts of the city that died actually at home and they were brought into uh, uh, the mortuaries. And in the city of Ouagadougou, there is also uh, these statistics from the, from the main hospital city, uh, main hospital in the, in the city that they are receiving uh, about, they are recording about four deaths every day, every day since the beginning of March. And when this interview was done, we were actually at, uh, in mid April, meaning that you can just do the maths and these deaths are, let's say, the heat related deaths, direct heat related uh, deaths in that, uh, in that hospital. And it's not just about health. It is also about the economy, for example, because of the power cuts, uh, uh, the cooling, the cooling sector, like uh, providing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, fresh fish, uh, providing uh, 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 fresh water, etc., was no longer possible. And as a result, many small businesses collapsed as a result of that. But of course, you will also see some businesses that will thrive because. Uh, 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 because of the demand of some products, like uh, 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 people will uh, tend to buy more power banks, people will tend to buy more uh, 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 dehumid dehumidifiers and so forth. So there was some impacts on the energy uh, and the, on the economy sector, but also on the water sector because of the lack of energy, many uh, water provision stations were down, meaning that it wasn't possible also to deliver water to many districts in these cities. And as a result, who speaks in terms of energy impacts implicitly means also impacts on the water sector. So, and again, these impacts is uh, are just like a snapshot of what the reality is because we do not know the full extent of these impacts. Now, what can be done? in terms of what can be the way forward. We have seen all of that. 
The first thing is that this should sound as a wake up call. A few years ago, if someone wanted to speak about heat waves in the region, it could look a bit ridiculous. I did a PhD in, uh, in extreme heat in the Sahel. And at the time I was regarded as someone not really serious because people were considering that they're used to it. This is not something that, uh, 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 that is relevant for the region. It is something for maybe other parts of the world, but for West Africa, they said they're used to it. But now that they have seen it, people are realizing that with climate change, extreme heat is really becoming a concern. It's going to be a threat to public health, but not just public health, energy and water provision in West Africa. And I'm not saying just the sign, because as I said, even the southern part of West Africa was also affected. And actually, if we do nothing, I'm certain that in the next couple of years, not decades, but just years, this could turn to become humanitarian disasters. It's a really serious matter that people need to consider in the region. And of course, this means that we should try to adjust or develop national and uh, regional West Africa wide regional uh, policies to tackle this issue of, uh, of extreme heat. And there is a role that civil society and communities can and should take. Concretely, what can be done? In the short term, I think national health services and public health departments should work together to warn people in advance and to take emergency measures. For example, for med services, it is important to uh, reinforce the capacity to monitor and predict extreme heat at all the time scales, seasonal time scale, sub-seasonal time scale, and weather time scales. We can leave the climate projections maybe to researchers, but at least from the operational perspective, it is mandatory for the national med services to have this information. In terms of the public health, it is also very important to at least be able to collect data to show the evidence. Everyone is certain in the region that the heat wave had so many impacts. And we are also certain that what we are getting in terms of information is not accurate because it doesn't measure the full extent of the, of the heat wave impact. It is important to reinforce the epidemiological surveillance in the region. It is also important to have concrete measures, concrete anticipatory and emergency uh, uh, responses to the heat. And of course, to arrive to this, it is important to have an interdisciplinary collaboration. Quickly, the med services and the public health bodies should work together, the med services and, I don't know, the energy, the, the water, uh, and uh, let's say the municipalities should work together. On a long-term uh, ba uh, uh, basis, I think it is important to work on the development of sectoral warning systems. This could be heat and health warning system. It can be heat and water warning system, heat and, uh, 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 and energy warning system and so forth. And more broadly, it is important to think of developing heat action plans. And what should be in a heat action plan for a given city or for a given country? This is what I'm detailing here. There is a reference document that was developed by the International Federation of the Red Cross, so you can have access to it. And it basically gives the main components of a good heat action plan. First of all, there is a need to understand the heat risk and then to prepare the risk by putting in place uh, the, 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 the collaboration mechanism that needs to exist. And then uh, uh, there, is, there is a need to also put in place some contingency planning at the scale of the season to have a, uh, a working and operational heat earth early warning system before an imminent heat wave, there are some warnings, there are some actions that need to, to happen during the heat wave or the actions and a review after the heat wave. And in the longer term, it is important to think of the urban planning for heat waves. So the, the construction infrastructure should be revisited. We should create more green spaces in cities. We could think of the, uh, the health and they also, for example, to smart and so forth. Uh, specifically for the health system, it is very crucial to ensure that they are ready to anticipate and observe the increased demand during the heat waves. Actually, when we speak of heat waves, the first impact that people are seeing is basically the, 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 the deaths, uh, the hospital admission, and so forth. So the health system will really be put to 
so they will receive some pressure. So it is very important for them to be prepared. It is also important to upgrade the physical infrastructure to basically face the heat. It is also important to provide the data. And this, again, this is very important for us to be able to take significant measures. We also need to have an understanding of what is the impact of the heat, what is the factor for which the heat is having some impact on people. But to do this, we need the, the data. We need the data to do the research, to do the analysis. It is also important for uh, the medical staff to be more aware of the heat risk, and therefore it is important to include maybe heat wave training in uh, uh, the curricula of uh, uh, medical staff. It is also important to make sure that our health workers and uh, patients are kept cool during extreme heat. And of course, the health sector in general could also contribute to climate change mitigation by reducing the carbon footprint. Um, I also think that uh, there are there are some 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 roles that the humanitarian sector needs to play, and this could uh, consist of supporting governments to build heat action plans. They can also contribute towards awareness raising. There is a very beautiful uh, 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 messaging that the Burkina Faso Red Cross. I believe you will have access to the presentation, and then you can click on the uh, on the link to go and see what was uh, developed. And of course they could develop anticipatory action mechanism. This is the example of the Red Cross. They are in place some mechanism that allow Red Cross national societies to access funding in preparation of a heat wave to take action long before uh, they occur. And it's not just that. My last slide is about communities. Communities also need to do something about this extreme heat. Because first of all, they are the first to be impacted by the heat wave and they have a better idea of the extent of the impact. So they should basically push the decision makers to, 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 to take action. So they should make some pressure groups. They should also make some advocacy. They should also contribute to uh, citizen science programs. So they can, for example, at the scale of the city, identify from their perception what are the most, uh, let's say, exposed uh, 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 neighborhoods, they can report uh, uh, some deaths that they think are related to extreme heat and so forth. They should also be able to support municipalities, for example, in the regreening of their cities. And of course, to take care of the most vulnerable people, they should really engage in, vol in volunteering, in uh, doing community outreach programs to make sure that the most vulnerable people are being cared for by them. So the key takeaways from this presentation are that although uh, 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 the season is not yet over, as I said, we are, we, are, we, are, we are staying in that very hot situation until at least uh, the end of June, but we are, it's very likely that this will be the hottest to date on record for the Sahel region, for many places in the Sahel. Severe impacts were observed in many sectors but because of the lack of data, we are not certain what is the full extent of this impact. We were not prepared for Nestle in the region to face that heat. There was very limited preparedness in the region, partly because we didn't receive the warning on time. And look, going forward, there is a need to uh, take urgent and long-term actions to help uh, the region be more prepared for what we are certain will come in the future. Heat waves are going to be more severe, more frequent in the future. So we need to be more prepared. And that is it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insightful presentation, um, Gigma, that just highlighted what those impacts are um, that is being experienced in West Africa um, with regards to extreme heat. And the, the wake up call for us to not be complacent and to be prepared and take action now from an individual up to a policy level to ensure that we have um, actions that are context specific. Um, for people who just joined us, we just heard a presentation by Gigma um, on the heat waves in West Africa looking at the causes, um, challenges, and impacts. Um, and so now I'm going to hand over to Gloria 
um, Dr. Gloria Mayamela, who will just give us a brief um, commentary um, with regards to heat health. And um, I'm handing over to you, Gloria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Or good afternoon, depending on where you are at. Celeste, if I may ask you to share my slides. Thank you. Put on PowerPoint. So thank you very much, Quickma. <laughs> I think that you know, just listening to that. I mean, I've had many presentations on the impact of it, and just your presentation again raises an alarm about the urgency to come up with solutions um, to protect the most vulnerable. Um, mine is, uh, my role is just to link this to 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 the to health and ensure. And I think Quickma has already covered some of the what we are seeing in terms of the impact of heat on health. And, you know, just to start with saying that the risk for, for, for heat or heat stress is, you know, as a measure of exposure, how much are you exposed to high ambient temperatures, heat waves in the Sahel, you saw what the temperatures look like, wildfires, and, and your vulner the vulnerability, um, the extremes, they're, they're very old, they're very young, pre-exist people with pre-existing medical conditions. Uh, we are doing a lot of work on um, um, maternal and child cohorts. So the risks in pregnancy, and we'll share some slide around that. The risk for people who are in, you know, you know, outdoor workers as well as healthcare workers. And we, we have another study where we're looking at the impact of heat on the health of healthcare workers as well. So those, you know, the, the higher the vulnerable these populations are, the higher the risk of heat stress. Um, also the inequity, obviously, the, with with um you know lack of adaptation resources particularly in um low middle income in countries the poor built environment infrastructure which is historical and does not accommodate for the fact that climate is changing we're seeing more heat waves um etc and also you know access to healthcare the ability to get the help that you need in time um also increases your risk for heat stress next slide please So we, you know, obviously, Wigma has, has kind, of, kind of like touched on some of the impact, and you know, looking at gen, at the general population, you know, the direct impact include um, heat stress, and with heat stress, would you get we're seeing more, more cases of dehydration, uh, people with uh, heat cramps, heat stroke directly, and again affecting the the most eld the, the elderly and 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 the very young. Uh, we are seeing. Uh, I mean, you saw the slide, the alarming slide of the number of deaths in some of the regions in the Sahel, um, the, the, you know, and we've seen that a lot, particularly in, in people with pre-existing medical conditions who are the most vulnerable. Um, the, the, the increased need for hospitalization, so the, the, the need... Um, um, the, the the impact, you know, the increased burden on hospitalization as a result of of of, of heat um, is is becoming alarming. And I think taking from Guigma, the need to have to prepare the infrastructure becomes extremely urgent. Um, indirectly, we talked about you know again the impact on health services. That suddenly you're going to have increased demand for health services as a result of, 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 of the impact of heat on health. Um, and, and you need to start thinking about the demand supply ratio in terms of, you know, will we have the you know enough resources to be able to deal with what we will be seeing in, and what we're already seeing as a matter of fact, um, as a result of heat waves. Um, the risk of infectious diseases, foodborne and waterborne diseases uh, are, are becoming even more apparent. Um, there is increased risk of accidents and as this could be, you know, for example, um, drowning as people are hot and they jump into whatever, you know, um, rivers or lakes to try and cool themselves. And also workplace workplace accidents as people are working in environments where it's extremely hot, they're not able to cope, uh, you run the risk of, of, of these accidents. And then obviously disruption of um, infrastructure um, as a result of, you know, um, excessive heat, particularly around wildfires um, that, that may um, uh, uh, destroy some of our infrastructure. Next slide, please, Celeste. 
So this is some of the work from a High Horizons colleague, and this is you know focuses particularly on um, maternal and newborn health, as we spoke, and you know uh, and the risks to women and 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 uh, fetus in the perinatal period and newborns. And what we have seen, and this is literature has shown, that there is increase as women are exposed to high temperatures uh, during pregnancy. There's an increased risk in pre uh, in hypertension and preeclampsia. There's increased risk in gestational diabetes. We are seeing now. Now, um, um, mental health disorders as a result of climate change, um, and we talked about you know the, the ability of women to access care. Um, in in where there is a, and I'll show you another slide. You know that we that we've now documented evidence that increased risk results in and stillbirth, preterm birth, and congenital abnormalities, and in a newborn, low birth weight, small for gestational age. We talked about hospital ad admissions. Unfortunately, we're also seeing a rise in mortality, and and with with the new ones and some of the studies that we conducted for where, that were conducted in Burkina Faso, where moms were complaining about suboptimal feeding practices. This is because of heat. The children are, are exhausted. Next slide, please. So this is a conceptual framework that was developed by my colleagues at High Horizons and WHO. Again, that just shows you the pathway um, in terms of extreme heat and maternal, maternal newborn and child health, all the way from, from exp heat hazards, exposures, and the vulnerability factors that, that I mentioned earlier on, and the direct impact, which we uh, touched on in terms of dehydration. And, you know, we're seeing... Um, you know, and the endocrine possible endocrine system dysfunction, um, increased in 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 um skin blood flow, for example, and and heat strain, and then the indirect impacts at at different levels, including individual level, uh, at a family and community level, um, at the healthcare worker, and again, you know, this is one of the studies that we're looking into the, the as I said, the impact of heat on healthcare workers, um, and in in other organized services, and and the last column just shows you the the outcome which I've just described in terms of some of the impact that we are seeing as a result of heat exposure. Next slide, please. So I, this is a slide, you know, uh, from our, our colleagues here um, uh, through High Horizons of Vets and just showing some li literature around the, the impact of or the direct effect of heat on these outcomes that I've just described. And you can see that preterm birth, uh, low birth weight and hypertension in, in pregnancy had, uh, ranked high in terms of the, uh, uh, the risks to um, as, a, as a result of uh, heat exposure. Yeah, thanks. Next slide. And I th this is a slide that I adopted from our colleagues at the Vets Planetary Health. And I think this is the part that, I, you know, I really want to zoom in, um, you know, to say, I mean, given the presentation from Guigma, to say that, you know, they, we, we, we simply do not have the luxury of time. We need to urgently come with uh, uh, develop climate adaptation intervention, and I'm 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 glad that uh, you know we seem to be catching on. On you know um, I know in South Africa, for example, we have a workshop tomorrow to look at the uh, national climate adaptation strategy. Um, but you know, obviously, there's a need to accelerate these. We need to um, you know we we. In terms of preparedness, uh, we need to think about, you know, I mean, one of our studies is looking at early warning uh, systems and sustainable cooling interventions. So, uh, yeah, and, and but but more importantly, a, a state of disaster. And I think, you know, uh, Guigma touched on that to say that now we need to be looking at what do we need to do? We need to be looking at our emergency services. We need to look at the, the capacity of our health systems to accommodate disaster. And I'm thinking about, you know, the, you know, if you remember the the COVID nineteen um, uh, um, era where we had, you know people setting up additional beds and infrastructure to accommodate the increase in demand. And those are some of the things that we need to be thinking about as we plan um, going forward uh, to, to, to adapt to the heat waves. And, and now, as much as we talk, you know, initially we had what we call first generation um, uh, adaptation intervention, we need to quickly pivot to second generation um, uh, adaptation intervention that look at mitigating the impact of heat at mass um, and, and uh, you know, being able to protect more more and more people as we have, as, as the frequency of um, heat waves um, start to heat us. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is just, you know, uh, you know, just talking to second generation cooling interventions. And this is not just, you know, these are, you know, interventions at community level that we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking of, you know, obviously, um, re rethinking around the infrastructure at, at um, in, 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 at hospital level within health, at, well, at health systems. Um, and some of the work that we're doing around mitigation, looking at how we can, you know, in increase, uh, you know how we, we we can reduce carbon emissions and increase cooling in the infrastructure to be able to so that you know the the infrastructure is uh, able to adapt ad, you know support the adaptation um for people that are in there um so so these are the kind of like interventions we need to be thinking about for example um availability of water uh, water uh, particularly in lmrcs where water can be as something that we take for granted it can be a scarcity and making sure that we re redesign where people can access water more frequently as we see more and more heat waves next slide please and uh, this is just an example um, of an in built environment intervention that was uh, conducted in the Northern Cape, uh, courtesy to the South African Medical Research Council, where they've shown a simple intervention, low cost inter intervention, where they walked, you know, came in and um, and painted uh, the roofs uh, with with cool white um, to reduce indoor temperature. And also they went in and installed household solar power for lightning and uh, solar street lights for, for for lightning, et cetera. Et cetera. And next slide, please. And and this was quite impact you know in, impactful um, in that it, it it reduced indoor temperature um, in these environments by almost thirty percent which was quite, quite a year and and also um, they were able to apply cool coat you know cold coating to over five hundred dwellings and and also they had you know solar street lighting in one village and this uh, tremendously improved the quality of life in these individuals so just you know to say that there are you know you know interventions that 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 are low hanging fruit that can be that we already in terms of thinking around policy and interventions that we already can be thinking about uh, that we already need to scale in, as a matter of fact to be able to protect the most vulnerable next slide please and i think that is my last slide so thank you very much and um over back uh, over to you celeste thank you Thanks. Thanks so much um, for that commentary, um, Gloria. Um, we will now give an opportunity for the next um, 10 minutes for people to ask any questions. Um, so we'll ask Kikma, and if your question is directed to Gloria, she can then respond. Um, but I will open up for questions. Um, I do see a comment um, on um, the chat from Rudolf who says that I think heat waves can directly impact the functioning of healthcare facilities. Increased power cuts will affect storage of refrigeration dependent um, supplies. Healthcare workers may not function optimally due to heat. Um, and as um, Rudolf, your, your comment is so valid. Um, um, Gloria also touched on one of the studies that's currently un we are undertaking that focuses on, you know, the physiological and the healthcare workers experience and how they perceive heat um, and how the actual work activities are improving um, or whether it's declining due to heat. So those are very valid um, points. In addition to that, when we think, think about vaccines and the cold chain that should be kept, um, so those are very valid points. I don't know, Kigmat, do you want to react to that while um, we wait for people to ask questions, you can raise your hand and we will allow you to ask questions. Yeah, sure. I think that uh, this is very clear indeed when uh, it is uh, too hot and as a result, there are some power cuts. Of course, uh, 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 the storage and uh, the refrigeration for some medical facilities will be impacted. And there is even worse. I know that at some point uh, in Mali, in several hospitals, surgical interventions were stopped simply because they couldn't go ahead. You imagine you take the risk to initiate an intervention and all of a sudden the power goes off. This, of course, will lead to uh, your patients, in the best case, dying. This is even the best case. So uh, it's really uh, 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 something which is of concern in the region. So. Uh, uh, they were obliged to halt all of the surgical interventions. And as a result, 
This means that many patients will have to wait until at least the rainy season, meaning that the queues are going to be excessively long uh, uh, and the medical staff will have some, uh, some, um, uh, some extra work to do. But this at least could be seen as, a, let's say, a climate smart intervention. It is better to do it rather than to start the interventions and get people die uh, in the process. So I think, yeah, there are so many direct impacts that uh, the heat wave and its uh, related power cuts could have on the uh, medical sector. Thanks. Thanks for that, um, Kikma. I do see um, two hands and then there's there are questions in the chat. So um, I'll take the questions um, and then I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Um, I'll start with you, Tabani, and then Christian. Thank you very much, uh, Celeste, for such a wonderful present session, colleagues. Uh, thanks to Dr. Kikma for the presentation. Um, just a few things. Some of them were covered by Dr. Maimela uh, on the interventions. Uh, she spoke about provision of shelter, water, and uh, change. But, but I would like to add the issue of change in the working hours of employees, especially those who are doing work outside. Uh, case in point will be farm workers. I think uh, colleagues in South Africa will remember the case of Northern Cape in January 2023. Uh, so I think even employees, employers rather need to think outside the box in terms of augmenting, uh, you know, working hours, especially where heat waves have been announced. Uh, it's very important that perhaps if employee, employees start work early uh, and then finish before the peak uh, hours of, of heat uh, on a particular day or they start work later in the day. But if these things... Um, uh, Celeste and colleagues are not entrenched into policy. Uh, people will continue using discretion in terms of what they implement. So there should be kind of an interface between science, uh, policy, and implementation. That interface is quite very, very uh, important. So let us let us begin to think about uh, that. There is also um, low hanging fruits which are around awareness. You know, we are presenting to uh, technocrats and people who know this kind of work. But how do we take it to the old lady in a rural village? You know, this kind of information so that they are able to heed weather warnings, uh, you know, whether issued through the ward counselor or on TV or on radio. You know, the issue of dissemination of weather warnings. Uh, how effective are those? Maybe Dr. Kikma can speak about the cases in West and Central Africa in terms of how efficient are circulation of weather warnings uh, so that people are able to respond appropriately uh, to these things. But also in the case of, um, of the work environment, how do we make occupational health and safety policies responsive to climate change issues? We, we need to begin to, to think about how our OHS policies are responding to issues of climate change uh, going forward. I kind of like that uh, example, uh, Dr. Maimela, that you made around uh, innovations such as painting with cool white color. Those are low hanging fruits that, that we can immediately implement, you know, in areas that are prone to, to, to heat waves. Uh, how we paint that uh, kind of building material that is being used. Issues of insulation, insulation, right? Uh, innovative designs, all of those issues come in very handy as we move forward as a nation. Even tree planting, something as simple as planting trees. I think there was a study, I don't know if it was done by UJ or Fates, which was around temperature difference between Alexandra and, and Sentin, where you find that the place is separated by a road. It's very close to each other, but because one is covered by a nice layer of trees, it is one degree uh, cooler than the other place, which does it, which, which does not have any tree covering. So you can see that even nature-based solutions come in handy. Uh, but thank you very much for very interesting mm -hmm. presentations that actually make an interface between climate change and health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Christian, please go ahead. One minute. Christian, okay. I hope I'm pronouncing it. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. Um, uh, um, I don't see. Okay, I can't see. Christian is unable to speak. 
Um, Toby, can you please um quickly go through your question? I'll give you one minute and then um I'll ask Melvin um to go ahead. Um, can I give you one minute each? Okay. Yeah, so th thank you both for your presentation. Uh, my name is Toby. So uh, my question is around um, its adaptation, uh, in in incentivization of its adaptation strategies at uh, within our, you know, our communities. I, I want to ask about uh, whether there are good examples of uh, its action plans as well as uh, strategies that can be looked into really, that can be like a model within the African contest. If anyone knows about this, or they are present actually. Yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Melvin. Hi everyone. My, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Melvin Otieno from Kenya. I like the discussion today on heat because I'm currently doing uh, my PhD in, in this topic. And I was just wondering, based on the speaker's uh, uh, topics, I I am wondering if uh, there is an opportunity for, let's say, within the chance network for mapping out, let's say, projects that have been done in African context, as far as heat is concerned. Because uh, when I was doing my literature search, I realized that a large volume of global scientific publications and the wealth of knowledge is stemming from extensive research power from the wealthier countries, that is from the United States and Germany, and does not necessarily reflect uh, on the African context. So I was just uh, kind of suggesting if we can improve our research output and also contact, conduct more research studies that will ca capture local conditions and release publications because there is less data from African settings. So I think this is an opportunity for us to really push forward for this because it's a serious issue, especially also affecting the humanitarian setting like uh, this, the, the, the current speaker had shared, you know, so I think there's an opportunity for really focusing more on this. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Melvin. Um, we have another question in the chat, um, Gigma. What are the challenges in rolling um, out interventions to other settlements? She's from, it's Juanita from CSIR. And then another question is, um, majority of the most vulnerable and climate affected communities live in mud houses, Nyatas, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, without windows where they live with their wild stock. Um, how can we address the gap in policy or res um, research um, to context specific action or interventions some of the recommendations around cooling. I believe even in the Sahel, they have makeshift structures um, for habitats. So if you can touch on that, and my last question will be from Candice, uh, please go ahead. Hi everyone, um, thank you for the presentations and information. Um, I'm from the city of Cape Town local government um, and there's numerous challenges with implementing heat related interventions in low income communities and informal areas that re it requires policy changes at a local government um, point um, to basically adjust budget and release funding so that funding is available and that's a like so it's a whole process um, I was wondering if there are any recommendations or lessons learned on um, implementing easy wins um, like the painting of um, of roofs with a cooling um, paint if there are any recommendations in how you can escalate the, those easy easy wins interventions at the local government um, point or level, um, because we are looking at everyone. So we're looking at all the low-income communities, all the informal settlements, and usually it's easier to just do a pilot in one community and um, in terms of funding um, and project availability and implementation and then work with that community. But we are looking, like um, the previous speaker said, there's no time, there's no time anymore for policy changes and this and that we need to implement. So I was just looking mm -hmm. at this, um, wondering if there's any good recommendations or lessons learned on escalating um, investments in, in um, easy to win interventions at the local government level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Kigma, I will allow you to please respond in two minutes um, for us to also have some announcements at the end. Please go ahead. Okay, two minutes. I'm not sure we'll be able to cover everything, but yeah, rapidly. I think uh, uh, regarding uh, the awareness raising issue, indeed, actually, 
it is not yet, uh, it's not something which is specific to heat waves only. Weather and climate uh, warning are relatively, let's say, difficult to communicate to communities, at least from the med services perspective, maybe because of the specific context of West Africa or, or Africa in general. So because of uh, the lower uh, rates of literacy, because of uh, the language barriers, it is often difficult for med services to address the issue. But as I said, at least one advantage of heat waves is that when it comes to uncertainties, we have less uncertainties than when it comes to hazards such as floods or, or drought, for example. So it is uh, possible for med services to work together with also uh, communication specialists to see what can be done uh, uh, about it. In terms of incentivization measures across Africa, unfortunately for the case of Western Central Africa, there has been close to no intervention at all uh, 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 regarding the extreme heat. So there is no much in terms of lessons that can be uh, uh, shared with uh, uh, people from the other regions. But at least there are some kind of concrete measures that people have taken by themselves without support from the state. For example, I see, I, I see that in the city of Ouagadougou, for example, many construction sites have tried to adjust the working hours. So now many uh, many staff are working rather in the night because of the peak of the heat during the day. This will work in some districts of the city where power is still available, where, for example, power is not available. If you do not have light, this is not something which is feasible. But at least I think it is a recommendation that can be uh, 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 shared with other regions, other contexts, because as long as we have power, this, for example, is something that can be uh, uh, done. There was a question in terms of the mapping of heat studies across Africa. I think that the Global Heat Health Information Network, which I'm certain you are familiar with, has done something uh, uh, regarding that. Maybe later on I can put the link in the chat for you and you'll be able to access the studies and the, the heat action plans, the early warning systems that exist on heat waves in Africa. You will see that it's not much, don't be surprised. But yeah, at least uh, we have uh, something where we can have access to it. And they're actually doing a review at the moment to actually collect all the information from various countries. So I think that even the research that we are doing currently can be also added to that mapping. So maybe I can share you, uh, I can share with you the link and you'll be able to uh, go and look for it. Um, there was a question in terms of the challenges in rolling out um, uh, this intervention in different settlements. Uh, actually, uh, uh, from one context to the next, it's never the same. So uh, uh, the challenges would definitely be different. And the most, the most challenging thing is that actually those people that are the most vulnerable are also, uh, let's say, the most exposed to the extra heat. When you live in Islam, when you live in a mud house, or let's say in a non-heat adapted infrastructure, you also likely will depend on a uh, uh, on an outdoor activity, for example, meaning that even if they're, they're able to basically shield you during the night, during the day, you will still be exposed. So. They, there may be some some reflection, some some research that needs to be to be done to see what what policies can be adapted to these uh, to the various uh, settlements that we have across uh, Africa. Uh, in terms of uh, yeah lessons learned and any recommendations on uh, let's say low hanging fruit uh, uh, measures such as roof painting. Again, this has not yet been. Uh, uh, implemented significantly in West or Central Africa to a scale that it can be, uh, uh, let's say, replicated or from, from which we can draw ex uh, lessons at the moment. But I'm certain that maybe after this specific uh, heat wave season that we are witnessing, uh, by the end of the season, there may be some, some kind of uh, 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 workshop, some lesson learned workshop that will be organized. And from there, maybe we could have something to share more widely. I think this is uh, what I have. I know I've already exceeded the two minutes, but of course I can drop my email in the chat and I'm happy to take any other question. Um, great, thanks. Um, we will also forward the presentation and we had some additional questions in the chat um, that we'll share. Gloria, I see your hand. We are out of time.
Um, so I, <laughs> I think um, as a member, maybe you can quickly say something and also just touch on the conference. Um, yes, please go ahead. No, no, um, I think just, you know, two um, comments um, responding to Tabani. I mean, you know, Tabani spot on about the policy, policy implementation implement um implications or implications of what we are embarking on and you know particularly around changing changing of work hours um to accommodate people but i mean what we are saying is i mean and then that's why we have these platforms to say that we need to accelerate policy change you know there is no time uh, for us to wait for two or three years down the line for policy to be um, effected and implemented and and the other comment is um, to Candace to say that, you know, as we develop these these plans, these plans obviously need to be costed. And with that costing, then that then allows the unlocking of financial resources to be able to scale some of the interventions that we're talking about. But, you know, we also need to look outside of the government. I mean, there are institutions like, for example, the Green Climate Fund that can, you know, uh, that has many, you know, ring fence uh, to build climate resilience, particularly LMRCs. And I think those are the institutions we need to find out you know how to access those resources because um uh, you know that can go a long way towards um addressing some of the issues and and yeah so 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 there are i think we, we need to look you know outside of the box and look for other resources that we might find to be able to scale um in the interest of time i think uh, you know just uh, and I'm, I'm now wearing my hat as a climate uh, as a chance uh, steering committee member um to uh, i think fortunate is on the line perhaps fortunate can speak to the upcoming fortunate is, yeah 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 thank yeah, you unfortunately thanks sorry i've got a very bad internet today um so I might just get kicked out. And if that happens, Gloria, maybe you just come in and uh, talk about the conference. Um, so this is the first ever Climate and Health Africa conference that's going to be held in Harare in Zimbabwe this October from the 29th to the 31st of October. Um, I remember the earlier speaker from Kenya who's doing a PhD said, there's a depth of literature in our context. There's very little evidence that can help inform and charm policymakers on what needs to be done. And hence the scarcity of interventions that perhaps work within our region, um, considering our socioeconomic um, uh, status and context. So this is the platform where these types of research are going to be showcased um, from East Africa, Central Africa, um, West Africa, North Africa, and Southern Africa. We've got, um, we're partnering with um, the Chance Network, um, which is this network where this webinar is happening. And therefore, um, we're encouraging as many of you as possible to submit in abstracts. And we're going to open registration at the end of May. And this is going to last until and uh, mid-August, and this is also the time that people can submit their abstracts and apply for scholarships. There will be about 60 scholarships for early career researchers and established researchers from the African region, and the scholarships will cater for air travel, ground travel, accommodation, uh, stipend, and conferencing. So we want to encourage as much um, evidence as possible to be tabled um, uh, in these days. But more importantly, this is also a platform where academia is going to meet policy. So we will have over 30 policymakers coming in from over 30 uh, sub-Saharan African countries through the chance network. So we should be able to have that interface between policy and practice and strategize on what works. We shall be sending the data dates uh, soon through uh, the chance steering committee so that people can uh, can apply through the online process. Thank you, Celeste. Over to you. So thank you so uh, much. I'm fortunate um, for an update on the conference. Thank you to Gigma for his uh, presentation and Gloria for your commentary. Everyone will make time to attend the session. If you're not a chance member yet, um, please feel free to scan the, the code um, and join the network.
Um, we will be sharing the slides and um, Gigma will respond to questions that it could not respond to. Um, please look out for our next webinar. We will be sharing more information um, over the next month. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.